Hello. Today, we're going to talk about analog and digital. Now, you've probably heard those terms before, probably from advertisers trying to convince you that whichever one their product uses is superior to the other, used by those other products. But they both have their uses, and knowing the difference between them will come in handy later. The most basic difference is that an analog signal is recorded by creating a continuously variable physical quantity, such as the position of a line, a magnetic field strength, or voltage that is analogous to your incoming signal, whereas a digital signal is a series of discrete measurements that are recorded as numbers or digits. An analog clock uses the position of its two hands to tell you what time it is. A digital clock shows you numbers. In theater, the people who spend the most time fighting with this are the audio folks, so most of our examples will come from their world, although we will also talk a little bit about analog video at the end. In an electric analog system, we start off with, say, a microphone. It picks up the sound and then outputs a continuously variable voltage that is proportional to the sound that it is picking up. For example, if I were to blow on this conch shell, it would produce alternating high and low pressure, which would be picked up by the microphone and turned into positive and negative voltage. The voltage is analogous to the air pressure that the microphone is detecting. This voltage is then fed into your sound system, where it is eventually routed to an amplifier, which, well, amplifies it. This amplified signal is then sent to a speaker, and the cone of the speaker moves back and forth in proportion to this incoming voltage, recreating the sound that was picked up by your microphone, only louder. This is great, except that any little bits of extra voltage that get picked up by any part of this system are added to your signal. It's infinitely variable, so it happily accepts any interference and just adds it right in, feeds it on down the line. The first analog audio recordings were done by having a needle vibrate up and down in response to your sound, carving a oscillating groove into either a cylinder or a disc. The shape of your groove was analogous to your sound. You would then put a playback needle into that groove and as it traveled down it, its motions, its vibrations, would be turned back into sound. First, by having the needle vibrate a small diaphragm that then vibrated the air directly, and later, by turning those vibrations into an electrical signal that could be amplified and reproduced. Once again, it is basically infinitely variable, but it is also vulnerable to noise. Any scratch, any inconsistency in the lacquer, any piece of dust, your needle will run over those and turn them into sound that you don't want. The ongoing efforts to conquer this noise and to get audio to play well with these new computer things led to the creation of digital audio. With digital audio, instead of recording your sound as a groove and some vinyl, or as a continuously changing magnetic field on some iron oxide on some tape, you sample your incoming signal at regular intervals and then record the intensity of each sample as a number. So here we have an analog signal. The height of our line above or below our axis is equivalent to our positive or negative air pressure, if this was, for example, an audio signal. Now we want to turn this into a digital signal. So we will, at regular intervals, measure the height of our line and then write that down as a number. Don't worry, I'm not going to make you watch the whole thing, not even in fast forward. So I have drawn my grid of one inch squares. I have labeled this axis zero through 16, and I have gone across and recorded the position of our wave that we're trying to record as a series of numbers down here on the bottom. This has many advantages. Number one, ease of reproduction. Once you have recorded your series of numbers, 
it's very easy to store them electronically, copy them with perfect accuracy as many times as you would like, and send those copies almost anywhere in the world electronically. In the record days, if you were working with someone who didn't live near you, and you had a song or a sound effect that you wanted them to hear, you either had to mail them your record, or they had to go to their local record store and find their own copy of that record and purchase it. And remember, there was no online shopping in those days. What was in the store? That was what you got to pick from. I mean, I guess that's easier than mailing them some sheet music and having them gather up musicians to play it, but not great. Things got significantly better once we got magnetic tape, especially these little cassette tapes. Um, they're smaller, they're less fragile, but there's still a problem. Every time you copy an analog signal from one media to another, there is always some noise, always some imperfections, and those just get added onto your new copy. And if you then copy it again, more noise, more imperfection, gets added onto the new copy, and so on. Number two, accuracy. Most digital signals are conveyed in binary, which we'll cover in another video. This means that your equipment does not need to be able to accurately track every little minute change in voltage and preserve it perfectly. All it needs to be able to do is tell the difference between a signal indicating a 1 and a signal indicating a 0. For example, if we needed to send 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, and anything above this level was a 1, and anything below it was a 0, then this signal would convey the information that we wanted to. But so would that signal. That would sound terrible in analog, but in digital, as long as it stays above or below where it needs to, it doesn't care, the information comes through. You can also add extra bits that are error checking, and you can resend pieces of data that are corrupted. Now, a digital signal does not need to be encoded in binary. It doesn't even need to be electronic. You could record and transmit a digital signal by taking regular measurements, writing those numbers down on a piece of paper, rolling that up, and then putting it into one of those old pneumatic tube systems. Thump! You have just transmitted a digital signal. Number three, cheaper and lighter equipment. Once you have turned your signal into numbers, you can feed those numbers into a computer and then just do math at them. Our old analog mixer weighed over 300 pounds, and that didn't include the power supply, which was a separate 40-pound box. Our new digital mixer has more channels, more effects, more processing, and an internal power supply, and weighs just over 100 pounds. In the analog days, a plate reverb involved a literal 3 foot by 5 foot sheet of metal. Nowadays, it's an app that you can download and run on your phone. So that's great. But what are the downsides? Because there's always downsides. The first one's pretty minor, and that's just legacy recordings. We haven't digitized everything yet, but we're working on it. S but sometimes, if you want a particular piece of media, you need to find an old analog recording. And be aware that you will also make, need to make sure you have the correct machine to play it back on. You can't just download a plugin for Winamp or VLC and say, OK, figure it out. Two, if you don't take measurements often enough or accurately enough, you can lose details. This grid here works well enough for this wave, but what if our signal looked like this? We're still crossing in basically the same places. We would record the same numbers, but we would be losing all of these little peaks and valleys. The work of figuring out how often you needed to take samples to accurately recreate your incoming sound was done by Harry Nyquist and Claude Shannon building on work done by Sir Edmund Whitaker. I'm not going to go into details, the math gets complicated real fast, but basically you need to sample at twice the rate of the highest frequency sound that you want to capture. So most humans, barring accident or age, can hear up to about 20 kilohertz, so anything above 40 kilohertz sample rates should be fine. Most modern digital audio samples at either 44.1 
or 48 kilohertz. There are some effects systems that use higher sample rates, but that is so that they avoid processing errors while they're doing, you know, echoes or other, other processing. There are people who claim that they can hear the digital steps in digital audio. Uh, those people are lying. They're either lying to you because they want to sell you something, or they're lying to themselves because they spent way too much money buying something. Please note that this is not the same as being able to hear compression artifacts. Speaking of which... Number three, file sizes. This is becoming less of a problem nowadays, but especially uncompressed video still takes up huge amounts of space. There are compression algorithms that will make your file sizes smaller, but they increase the load on your computer, and depending on which one you use, they may also lose some of the data that you have recorded. They're usually designed so that they only lose data you wouldn't notice anyway, but it's still a consideration. If you overdo the file compression, you can be left with compression artifacts. These are noticeable defects in your signal that are caused by, well, you just, you tried to squeeze that file down too small, and now you're paying the price. These, you can absolutely hear an audio compression artifact. I mean, I can hear them, and I had a potato cannon go off next to my head. Finally, we're not digital beings. We are made of meat. Anything that you want another person to see or hear needs to be converted back to analog at some point. A digital audio file sounds like screaming robots until you feed it through a digital to analog converter, but you can play a record without electricity. Now, mostly when we're talking about analog signals nowadays, it's audio. We still use a lot of analog audio. In fact, the microphone that I'm wearing right now, it's analog. There was also analog video transmission, and I'm going to talk about it for just a moment because I think it's neat. In an analog video system, you would have your performer, you would have a camera, and then using a series of lenses, although I've only drawn the one, you would project the image of your performer onto the surface of a special vacuum tube known as an image orthicon tube. That name rolls off the tongue easily. The surface of the IMI, as it was known, was coated in a special substance that would react to the amount of light that was striking it. You would then have an electron beam that would sweep from side to side and then from bottom to top, and the outgoing signal would vary depending on the amount of light striking the surface of your tube. That signal would then be transmitted to your television which had another vacuum tube inside it called a cathode ray tube. The cathode ray tube had a surface, once again, coated in a special substance, but this would glow depending on how strong the electron beam was. And so your incoming signal would modulate the strength of that electron beam, and as it swept from left to right and top to bottom, it would recreate the image that your camera was pointed at. This, the IMI, was so important to early broadcast television that when the TV industry decided that they wanted to do an award show to recognize excellence in broadcast television, they decided that they would call that award the Emmy. But when the first statues arrived, they noticed it looked like a lady, so they decided to feminize it and call it an Emmy. Anyway, that's all for now, and thank you for watching.